unthinkable congressman represents two crises, one private and one public that happened in the span of a single week. Take us back to that week, if you could. Well, you're talking about the worst week of my life, I suppose. Um, you know, we suffered the catastrophe of losing Tommy on the last day of uh, December in 2020. Um, and um, so, um, you know, that's that's a, an inexpressible nightmare, basically, what, what that was. And Tommy was uh, a young man of magnificent gifts and talents, and he was brilliant. Um, and he was a poet, he was a playwright. Uh, he was in his second year at Harvard Law School, but the, the truly remarkable thing about him was his heart because he was someone who had just a boundless love of the world and of uh, all living beings, all sentient creatures. He used to pet our dogs and say, you know, Potter, you're such a fine sentient being. Uh, but anyway, he was suffering uh, depression and um, um, he, he was back home from school because of COVID-19 um, and grew increasingly despondent um, and developed a plan unbeknownst to us to take his life and he did. And um, so uh, this was a terrible catastrophe for us and um, Everybody was home, our daughters were home, Sarah and I were here, lots of family came. Um, and then um, I had been getting ready really for a few months for the first Wednesday in January, which the 12th Amendment says is the day for Congress to meet in joint session to count the Electoral College votes. And we had anticipated uh, aggressive maneuvers against particular states. And Speaker Pelosi had asked me to prepare answers for what was going on uh, with uh, a handful of other colleagues and we were prepared. Um, but the, the night before, uh, my daughter said, don't go in. I said, this was a, a constitutional responsibility. It would be, you know, my first day back. Um, and I said, why don't you, why don't you come with me? Anybody who wants to come can come. And so our younger daughter, Tabitha, decided to come. And uh, our son-in-law, Hank, who's married to our older daughter, Hannah, he decided to come. Everybody else was going to stay at home. Um, and so they, they were there uh, with me on that day. And uh, that was a, a nightmare of a different kind. Although I record in my book, Katie, that um, although it was an objectively terrifying situation, I really experienced no fear because I felt like the very worst thing that could ever happen to me had already happened. And what were these fascists and hooligans going to do that could be worse than what I'd already experienced? But I was very angry about what was taking place. And, you know, it was set about in my mind to try to figure out exactly what they had done um, in trying to overturn the 2020 election and how they coordinated this inside political coup against the vice president and against Congress with um, a violent street attack, which um, ended up storming the Capitol, injuring 150 of our officers and shutting down the counting of electoral college votes for the first time in US history. You call it a self coup that was uh, instigated by the president of the United States. Did you ever think that you would hear those words? Well, I, I didn't even know that expression, which is a political science expression that they use to describe a coup that comes from the inside. Usually we think of coups as being something from the outside directed against the president, oftentimes by the military. Uh, here, of course, the military was standing in strong defense of constitutional democracy, but the president orchestrated the coup against the vice president. Um, and after trying multiple different avenues of attack uh, to overturn the presidential election, uh, Donald Trump finally settled on this avenue of going after 
uh, Mike Pence during the January 6th proceeding. But he had tried before to get uh, state legislatures simply to avoid the popular results and to declare electoral college tickets for Trump when um, Republican legislative leaders in the states refused to do that. Then he moved to try to browbeat and coerce state election officials, including the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, simply to find electoral college, find popular votes. And he, he had asked Brett Raffensperger to find 11,780 votes. That's all he was asking for. So that, that was not Donald Trump trying to stop voter fraud. That was Donald Trump trying to commit voter fraud. Um, and um, when all of these prior attempts to overturn the election failed, that's when uh, they settled on the idea of trying to get Pence to declare extra constitutional powers, powers outside of our rule of law to unilaterally rebuff and repudiate electoral college votes from the states. The purpose there was to lower Biden's total in electoral college from 306 to something below 270, thereby kicking the contest immediately into the House of Representatives under the 12th Amendment for a so-called contingent election. And the reason that they wanted Speaker Pelosi and the Democratic House to be deciding was because in a contingent election, we don't vote according to one member, one vote. We vote according to one state, one vote. And after the 2020 elections, they were in control of 27 state delegations in the House. We had and have 22. One, Pennsylvania was split down the middle. So even had they suffered the defection of the at-large member from Wyoming, Liz Cheney, which I think they would have, they still would have had 26 votes and they would have declared Trump president. Uh, he would have seized the presidency for another four years and he likely would have invoked the Insurrection Act at that point uh, to call in the National Guard, which he had not dispatched earlier in the day uh, to put down the insurrectionary chaos he had unleashed against us. So he would have basically made himself the hero saying, you know, Speaker Pelosi couldn't keep order here, but I'm keeping order here, and then making himself president for another four years. That was basically the plan. You taught constitutional law at, at American University, and all your years teaching constitutional law, did you ever imagine something like this happening? Well, what's interesting is we had um, we had clearly imagined the parliamentary attacks on the election. We were prepared for that. We had answers to everything they were going to say about Arizona and Georgia and Pennsylvania. After all, uh, 61 federal and state courts had uh, examined all of their claims of electoral fraud and corruption and rejected all of them. Um, so we had very good answers across the board. We'd also anticipated are uh, some violence outside, but what had never occurred to me was that the whole proceeding would actually be overrun by violence and shut down. And that this uh, political coup against the election would be coordinated with a violent street attack by thugs and fascist groups that were brought together for the first time. You know, Katie, a lot of people recognize that Donald Trump used these violent elements, you know, the, the Proud Boys who he had told to stand back and stand by, and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and the QAnon networks that he kept flirting with and so on. But it's also the case that they used him too. Because remember back in August of 2017, when they tried to unite the right at that uh, horror show in Charlottesville, Virginia. I was um, there. Well, they only had 500 people, right? Um, they went from 500 people there, and they certainly did enough damage, and they killed Heather Heyer, and um, they, they turned a great, a great city upside down. But um, it was contained. But when it got to January 6th, the, the extremist group was now several thousand in uh acting as basically frontline stormtroopers for a march of 40 or 50,000 people. They were in league with the president of the United States. They stormed the Capitol and they came very close to overturning the whole democracy. So in addition to everything else, Donald Trump empowered an extreme right-wing street fascist movement, the likes of which we have not seen in America since 
basically the 1930s. I want to talk more about President Trump's role and the future of the Republican Party, but I'd like to go back, Congressman, to Tommy for just a moment. It strikes me that you were not as fearful as you might have been because you had just faced the worst thing a person can really be confronted by, and that is the death of a child. Um, Tommy, by all accounts, was truly extraordinary. And I know we all think our kids are extraordinary, but your son was so outstanding. He was a student at Harvard Law School. He was a deep, deep thinker from an early age, how he would go in his room and think about big, big issues. I'm sure he, his goal in life was to change the world. Can you help us understand his, his struggles with depression, how they manifested themselves and how such a brilliant person could be plagued by such demons? Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words about Tommy. Um, we obviously, you know, loved him um, endlessly and infinitely, and we think about him all the time. Um, and we've heard from lots of families that have been in a similar situation. And of course, each of these losses is um, overwhelming. And uh, all of our kids are extraordinary and unique in their own way. And so each one is a, a nightmare and a tragedy for the family. And of course, we're living in a time of great trauma with having lost 900,000 people to COVID-19, comparable numbers to the opioid crisis, um, gun violence, the mental and emotional health crisis, the sharp increases in suicide, especially among young people. Um, you know, all of these things have created a, a sense of great despondency and demoralization in the public. And we've got to, you know, we've got to bring everybody back uh, from this um, however we can. Um, I guess I would just say in answer to your question, um, you know, for those of us who have not suffered from depression, it's very hard. I, um, you know, I spent a long time reading about depression before writing about Tommy. And I think I really didn't understand it until something very weird happened, which is I, um, I went to get a, a CAT scan um, on my stomach um, and it ended up being nothing. That's the good news. But I was put into the CAT scan machine. And I don't know if you've ever gone through that. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, apparently they will give people Valium or music or something, but I was just put under and I was just staring at the top of the machine, which was a few inches away from me. And you wouldn't think that that would cause, you know, such a sense of claustrophobia and panic, but I was under there for 37 minutes and at several times, I was tempted to just abort the whole operation and stop, but then I knew that I would have to start over again. Um, but I had such a sense of entrapment and such a sense of fear and terror that for the very first time, I think I began to experience just the, the tiniest, tiniest bit for the shortest period of time, some of what Tommy described depression being like. And for those people who've gone through it, it's been described as the beast, as an endless dark tunnel of terror and horror. And uh, it's, um, it's a nightmare even to hear people describe, you know, what it's been like. I mean, Tommy, like uh, a lot of young people who have this visionary moral quality to them. He was like a world-class empath, um, felt the pain and the suffering of the world and of everybody. You know, he was a, a devout vegan um, for several years. He basically arrived at the conclusion that, um, you know, 
that we have no right to um, to subject other sentient beings to to pain, um, and that was like a, just a radical axiom for him. Um, and um, you've got to live your life in a way to try to promote the well-being of uh, yourself and other people and and the animals. And he would say, you know, in the age of uh, you know, beyond sausage and impossible burger, there's no reason for anybody basically to be using animals for the consumption of protein. There's just, there's no need for it. Are you vegan? I'm assuming your whole family is. <laughs> yeah. Um, everybody has been moved to different levels of vegetarianism or veganism. And I, I talk about how Tommy converted well, it's got to be hundreds now, but certainly we knew dozens of people. Um, and he wasn't like the guilt tripping kind of vegetarian. It wasn't about making people feel bad, but it was sort of going through the arguments. But he also wrote a lot of poetry about why he became a vegan. And so people would say, well, why are you vegan? And then he would get up and he would deliver a poem about it. And then people would say, I could never go back after hearing that. You can find some of those poems online, him doing it. I'm sorry, so sorry for your loss. And uh, the loss of a child is something no person should ever have to experience. But wow, what a legacy Tommy left behind. And I'm glad he's really present in your life and the life of so many people because of your book. Um, really, there are no words to, I think, express, express our sympathy to you, Congressman. You know, you, you were dealing with the loss of Tommy. I mean, it was so fresh, so raw, so new when the insurrection happened. And it does strike me that you predicted this in many ways because you were charged with, by Speaker Pelosi, with figuring out ways that President Trump might try to circumvent or thwart the electoral process. Was it eerie for you to see, we thought this was gonna happen and my God, now it is? Well, the part that we had not predicted was the crossover of the street militancy and violence into the Capitol and the merger of this violent insurrection with the inside moves for a political coup. Um, and the, the, what I condemn myself for in the book is not putting these things together. Uh, and I think for different reasons I described that I should have been in a place to have predicted that and been far more focused than I was just on the physical security side of things. And not just, uh, you know, in terms of, answering the various parliamentary moves that were being made, um, you know, ag against the result or, you know, the outside political efforts to attack the whole electoral college process. I was prepared for those things, but I didn't put it together with what now looks in hindsight to be telltale signs of a violent insurrection that was well coordinated with this political attack. After all, I mean, it wasn't a random demonstration. It came right at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, January the 6th. Um, and the people were sent right down from that White House rally to the Capitol where uh, then President Trump was telling people to go. So uh, these different components were actually well coordinated against us and um, because of the heroism of the Capitol officers who literally put their lives on the line and many of whom ended up with broken jaws and necks and vertebrae and uh, others who ended up with traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress syndrome. And also because Vice President Pence uh, on that day lived his oath of office. He upheld his oath of office because of those things we were narrowly able to defeat the first coup in American history. You're also on the January 6th House Select Committee charged with investigating the attack. After a year, more than a year, of collecting interviews and evidence, um, how much closer are we to understanding 
the forces that were at work on that day? We're, we're much closer, but it was a very complex picture because um, the, think of it in terms of three rings of sedition that took place on January 6th. The outer ring was tens of thousands of people who arrived with uh, a spectrum of motives, uh, but the president had called for a wild protest uh, in Washington. And that mass protest became a mob riot, which injured our officers. The middle ring of activity was the domestic violent extremist groups. And this was the realm of the insurrection. These people came with the idea of overthrowing the government, shutting down the electoral college process and installing Donald Trump uh, as president for another four years. And this were all, all the extremist groups that were brought together uh, into this insurrectionist band. But the very inside of it was the ring of the coup. And that was targeted at Pence just to get him to make this uh, totally unlawful uh, gesture of rejecting electoral college votes uh, in order to kick the entire thing into the House of Representatives for a so-called contingent election. So they exploited um, the various phases of the electoral college system, which is something of an antique, uh, in order to promote their plan. You know, the, the guy who sits next to me in the Rules Committee, Ed Perlmutter from Colorado, uh, said this used to be a day in the old days of bipartisan celebration. People would go out drinking and it would take 45 minutes and everybody accepted who the president was. It has now been transformed into uh, another terrain of partisan combat and even violence. So that's one of the things that our select committee has got to confront in terms of thinking about the future and fortifying the democratic process. What do we do about the fact that the electoral college, which worked so-so as long as we were willing to accept the, the basic legitimacy of the votes in the states, but if that's out the window and you've got strategic bad actors, what do we do now with the fact that the electoral college is this protracted, torturous set of fights about what's going to happen. Do you think Trump was the maestro, the puppeteer, the person who ultimately was doing the targeting of all these different groups? Well, th that's a complex uh, question. Uh, and, you know, we've received overwhelming cooperation from the witnesses in our investigation right up until you get to the entourage right around Donald Trump. So Steve Bannon, Roger Stone, Mark Meadows, who's kind of doing the hokey pokey, one foot in, one foot out. But there are, the people right around him have tried to maintain a kind of code of silence. So uh, some of it was clearly directed even publicly uh, by Donald Trump. Some of it we know came through intermediaries, but we don't know the exact proportions for every part of um, the assault on the election because we don't have you know complete testimony yet. How can you, a lot of people hear about Steve Bannon and uh, Mark Meadows and Roger Stone refusing to cooperate and they think, well, wait, how can they do that? Can't Congress compel them? Um, in theory, yeah. Um, I mean, there, there's three mechanisms by which we could do it. One is the criminal contempt, uh, which we've done um, in a handful of cases. We've held people in criminal contempt, and then it's up to the Department of Justice. Uh, unfortunately, the, the gears of the Department of Justice are moving slowly on that. Another possibility is civil contempt, that we go to court and we just try to get judges to compel them to participate, or again, to hold them in criminal contempt for not doing it. Uh, and the third possibility is what's called the inherent powers of contempt that Congress has, that is, we could ourselves try to compel their participation. So um, it's uh, a fine grained case by case determination about what to do in each particular case. Um, we've made progress in some of these cases, um, but it's frustrating in others, but we also don't wanna get completely caught up in one of these things and have that overtake the whole process. Why is Merrick Garland acting so slowly. A lot of people are very frustrated with the attorney general and the fact that more isn't being done. 
Well, uh, Attorney General Garland is a constituent of mine, and I don't speak ill of my constituents, Katie. Um, but I, I will say, you know, they've they've brought more than 750 uh, charges against people for different levels of involvement, all the way from trespass to assault on officers to destruction of federal property. They seem to be working their way up uh, with charges like seditious conspiracy. Uh, brought against Stuart Road and the Oath Keepers. And I, if it's proceeding the way other mob prosecutions have proceeded, you work your way all the way up to the top. So I've got to believe uh, that's what's happening. Um, obviously, there's a lot of political delicacy for an attorney general, especially coming out of a period where the Department of Justice was so deeply politicized and subordinated to the will of then President Trump about bringing these kinds of prosecutions. So I think they probably want to make sure that, you know, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and that they have all of the procedural formalities in place and that they've got all of the evidence. Um, in any event, you know, their investigation is about individual criminal accountability. Our investigation is about social and political accountability for all of us. What was the nature of that attack on our democracy and how do we ready ourselves and prevent it in the future? We wanna make sure that we're not fighting yesterday's battle. Uh, there's been a lot of focus, for example, on the role of the vice president, understandably so, but there was never any ambiguity about that before that the vice president's role was a purely ministerial and administrative one, not a decision-making role where the vice president could just declare unilaterally certain states electors to be invalid. Um, so if we clarify that, fine. I think that that's an okay thing to do, but I don't want us to think that, well, we clarify that, therefore everything's okay, because what we still have is an entire political party that's positioned itself outside the constitutional order, which has adopted a rule or ruin philosophy. Either they're going to rule and control everything, or they're going to destroy our ability to govern as a democracy. And that's an unacceptable attitude for a political party to adopt. And we've got to figure out ways to fortify ourselves against that. We're going to talk about the future of the GOP in a moment, but I wanted to ask you, Congressman, about Rudy Giuliani, who has indicated he is going to, you know, may testify or is in talks to testify and that he would be less confrontational. Um, how likely is he to offer substantive cooperation? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, I think we would have to take Mayor Giuliani's testimony for uh, what it's worth when he gives it. Um, and he obviously presents different uh, attitudes and poses in different contexts uh, that we see him. Um, but the, I believe that he will cooperate and I believe that he will do his best to explain everything that he was up to. Um, you know, well, one thing I've come to recognize about Donald Trump is that he uh, creates franchises. So there is a Steve Bannon group, there's a Giuliani group, uh, you know, there's a, a Ivanka Trump group. There's different groups of people who he uses for different purposes. And uh, I think the, the best that we can hope for is to find out from Giuliani what he, what his understanding was of his plan and his role as he had been assigned to work on it by uh, Donald Trump. Are you starting to chip away at all the obstacles that President Trump and his um allies have thrown in your way in terms of the work of the committee. President Biden, I know, ordered Trump White House visitor logs to be turned over to the committee because there are substantial, I guess, gaps in some of these phone logs. I mean, do you feel like you're getting finally the information, the material, the tools you need to really get to the bottom of all of this? Yes. The courts have overwhelmingly ruled in our favor any time when someone has come at the authority of uh, the select committee or our ability to receive the evidence that we want and need. Um, the Supreme Court historically has been emphatic that Congress has the right to collect the information it needs in order to legislate. And what would be uh, a more core legislative purpose than figuring out how to protect the continuing stability of the government itself against outside coups and insurrections. So we're winning there and we are getting 
uh, the evidence we need. And in a democracy, um, the truth really does want to be free. Uh, the, the truth will come out. It's just that we're in a race against the clock now. I mean, we see that we need to get this done this year. We are hoping to have hearings in the spring, hoping to get uh, our report out in the summer or the early fall. Um, we, we need to make a report to Congress and to the American people about what happened. You're, you're wanting to get your work done before the midterms. Can you explain why that's important? Well, the, every Congress, of course, stands on its own, unlike the Senate, which is a continuing body, which has, you know, overlapping terms of the senators. So it's just one third of the Senate that's up every two years. And it, it, it's a continuing body. The Congress itself um, ends at the end of this term. And then a new Congress is created for the next term. So all of the work of the committees ends um, in this term. And so this is the general clock that we're operating on. Um, and you never know what's going to happen in the next Congress. So, uh, the, you know, we have a strong bipartisan committee. We've got a great chairman in uh, Benny Thompson uh, from Mississippi. Uh, we've got a great vice chair in uh, Liz Cheney from Wyoming. It's the most bipartisan committee, Katie, I've ever served on. Um, you know, it's the only committee I serve on that doesn't begin basically with an hour of partisan invective and polemics and denunciation uh, where we just get right into the task at hand. And it's a good thing because the task is so important. Do you think the longer this takes, uh, the less invested the American people will be in getting to the bottom of it? That's something that I wonder about, Congressman. You know, we've been hearing about this for over a year. And I feel like the attention span of the American people is not particularly long. I know that's a rash generalization, but mm -hmm. how concerned are you that the longer this takes, the less people will care? I mean, I actually have the contrary impression. I think that every day that goes by, people get more and more fascinated and engaged with the question of how exactly we almost lost it all on January 6th. So I, I believe if anything, the public interest, the suspense is building um, for us to tell the complete story of how this took place, why it took place, and what we need to do to protect ourselves. Let's talk about the future of the Republican Party. Uh, is, you know, well, before we do that, can I just ask you quickly about how concerned are you about the midterms? And if the Democratic Party is going to get a major shellacking or thumping, whatever you want to describe it, as various presidents have, um, what what do you predict for the midterms? Well, I, I'm not much one for being in the prognostication business, Katie. I think I'll leave that to you guys. I'm more in the organization and mobilization business. I I've turned my campaign into something called Democracy Summer where we get high school and college students engaged. We teach them about the history of democratic struggles for the right to vote and to participate. And then we train them on how to register people to vote, how to educate people to vote, how to mobilize people to vote. And it's been adopted by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So we now have uh, 60 members across the country participating in Democracy Summer. We'll have more than a thousand young people engaged. And so I, uh, I just feel like our whole democracy is on the line right now, and we need to engage a new generation in the task of understanding it, loving it, and then defending it with all they've got. You have to wonder about what's going on at the state level with legislatures and with secretaries of state and people who are being put into these positions who are sympathetic to Donald Trump. It was interesting to read that the committee has issued another round of subpoena, subpoenas including two Trump officials and four prominent GOP officials from battleground states. How significant is evidence of a coordinated effort by the Trump campaign at the state level? And how concerned are you about what's happening behind the scenes, kind of quietly, state by state by state in terms of uh, putting these people in who are sympathetic to Donald Trump and have no qualms about overturning the will of the people. Well, I think you put your finger on it. Um, 
And this is why I'm saying we can't fight the last battle in just focusing on the role of the vice president in the January 6th proceeding. The big terrain for conflict, I think, coming in 2022 and 2024 is this effort to seize control over the electoral machinery. And the first thing they're doing is going after anybody who did not do the will of Donald Trump in 2020. So take Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, um, who's a lifelong devoted Republican who simply refused to make up votes. Well, they're going after him. They're getting one of my colleagues, Jody Heiss, to run against him for Secretary of State of Georgia. And you go state by state, you will see that anybody who refused to be a loyal soldier for Donald Trump's efforts to steal the election is now being opposed, deposed, um, fired, what have you. They're going after all of them, whether they're in an appointive office or in an elective office. So I'm very worried about that uh, because what's at stake here is the traditional idea of bipartisan or nonpartisan election administration. And they want to replace nonpartisan election administration with partisan election administrator, uh, administrators where they put in their loyal lieutenants. And then the ultimate appeal is not to uh, a bipartisan election board, but it's to the state legislature, which is in their hands or to the governor. Uh, that obviously resembles much more a banana republic than it does American democracy as we think of it. Do you think that Donald Trump will run in 2024, given the fact, I appreciate that you're not a prognosticator, but certainly you have, must have a view. Do you believe that Donald Trump will run again? Yeah, I, I'm planning uh, I'm planning all of my work around the supposition that he's running. He's telling people he's running. It makes sense um, politically because he's got that kind of control and has made sure he's got that kind of control over the GOP. Uh, it makes sense for him financially because the Trump presidency was above all a money-making operation. And I do fault myself and other Democrats for not putting forward from the very beginning his rampant violations of the emoluments clauses and the money that he was collecting both from foreign governments, but also from the US government at all of the golf courses and the hotels and the other kinds of commercial ventures. So yes, financially, I think he wants to keep uh, a good grift going. And politically, he's got the power to do it. And psychologically, of course, we know that he needs to do it because he can't stand the idea that he lost. He's been lying about his defeat by more than 7 million votes to Joe Biden for several years. Uh, and um, so I, I'm fully expecting it. And uh, what we need is not just the Democratic Party, but independents, uh, moderate Republicans, not under this, and conservative Republicans, not under the spell of Donald Trump, greens everybody to rally around to defend American constitutional democracy, because it's the whole experiment that's at stake right now. You don't think all these allegations, so at the state level, you know, all these investigations will result in some kind of, um, you know, criminal proceeding or civil proceeding that will prevent him from, from putting his hat in the ring again? Well, um, yes, I do believe he is starting to get his comeuppance in a whole bunch of criminal and civil investigations into things like real estate fraud, uh, bank fraud, uh, election fraud, like the investigation in Georgia to what he did with uh, Raffensperger. But uh, we also know he travels with uh, a huge team of lawyers for pretty much his whole business career. He's got a, a ton of money to defend himself and he's got a loyal cultish following that uh, is not going to be interested. I mean, as Donald Trump himself put it, he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and he's not gonna lose his followers. Uh, I mean, that's a strange thing to brag about, but that is the hallmark of an authoritarian religious or political cult. And he does exercise that kind of control. So those things might happen. We also have to take account, Katie, of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which is really important because it says that anybody who has sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution against enemies, foreign or domestic, and has violated that oath by participating in insurrection or rebellion shall never hold office again, either at the federal or state level. That's totally apart from impeachment and conviction. It's just a principle that's put into the 14th Amendment. And so uh, there are already 
some suits that have been brought about this relating to certain members of Congress, uh, one in North Carolina. We're watching that closely, but we're also trying to figure out what exactly does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment mean and how can it apply to the current situation? It seems to me, though, Congressman, you're telling us that Donald Trump is above the law, that he has these lawyers, he has a cult following, and that it's possible that none of these things will stick, which seems insane. Well, um, th this I agree with, but the rule of law is as strong as the people who are willing to enforce it. And so we've all got to be tough and hang tough for constitutional democracy. This is why uh, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, uh, the Republicans who voted to impeach, 10 of them in the House, the seven who voted to convict in the Senate. Um, to my mind, these are constitutional patriots. These are people who are standing up for their constitution above the rule of one guy or the interests of one political party. Um, and that's what we need everybody to do right now, regardless of what your party or ideology is. We're unified by virtue of having one constitutional framework and everybody has got to stand up for it uh, and stand up for the rule of law. I mean, Donald Trump is essentially a one man crime wave. I mean, you can find thousands of lawsuits uh, of him being sued by plumbers and electricians and small businessmen and carpenters, people he just decides not to pay and makes them sue him because he's got that army of lawyers and then they end up settling for pennies on a dollar. This is how he's done business for decades. And we know about his rampant violations of law uh, as president and the way that he just defies the constitution. So uh, it's frustrating how long it takes to enforce the law and make the law work. But I do think that um, he is going to get his comeuppance and in the, in the end, we we're going to say that our constitution was vindicated. And that's our historical assignment. Before we go, I want to ask you about the future of the Republican Party, which has clearly been taken over by the cult of Donald Trump. Can the party be rehabilitated in your view? Mitch McConnell is obviously working behind the scenes. It appears to thwart uh, another run by Donald Trump. But how can the party be rehabilitated? or return to its roots, whatever those are at this point? Well, when I had the chance to speak to Republican senators during the course of the Senate impeachment trial, I would say to them, this is something you've got to do for America. It's something you've got to do for the Constitution, but you have to do it for your own party too, because he will destroy your party. And what's so odd uh, is that they've they've basically threatened the destruction of their own party by following him uh, blindly, when he's not even really much of a Republican. He was a Democrat for a long time. He wanted to run for president on the Reform Party. He's made fun of the Republican Party. And so he's just a, a very uh, bizarre champion of Republican Party values. And these days, of course, there are none left. It's all him. Either you obey his will or you don't. So I don't know. Uh, I, I know that you know there are certainly Republicans like Liz Cheney who are challenging him on principle and trying to assert principles that should instead be the organizing glue of the Republican Party. We'll see if they're able to take him on. And if not, the Republican Party uh, will likely be replaced by another party. I mean, that's that has been the historical pattern when a party essentially walks the plank like that with you know someone who takes them in a hopeless direction. So, uh, you know, there's nothing in the Constitution about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party or even a two party system. Uh, there could be other parties that emerge and that might be a healthy thing for our politics. I was struck by a passage in your book about trauma because you've experienced trauma. We all have in some way, shape or form you have experienced extreme trauma over the last year plus. But I was wondering if you could read in your preface, it's page 15 to, to 14 to 15 um, about trauma. I'd be happy to, this is on the bottom of page 14. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've learned that trauma can steal everything from you that is most precious and rip joy right out of your life. But paradoxically, it can also make you stronger and wiser and connect you more deeply to other people than you ever imagined 
by enabling you to touch their misfortunes and to integrate their losses and pain with your own. If a person can grow through unthinkable trauma and loss, perhaps a nation may too. In closing, Congressman Raskin, do you, do you think our country can come out of this time of unprecedented turmoil and division stronger than ever? And what about those who truly believe the state of our union is in peril and the future of our democracy is bleak? Well, I don't want people to despair in any way. Um, for one thing, if you identify uh, the source of our immediate problems with um, Trump and Trumpism, as I do, you can uh, recognize that Hillary Clinton beat him by 3 million votes uh, in the popular vote, and then Joe Biden beat him by more than 7.5 million votes in the popular vote. The young people um, are not interested in the conspiracy theory. and the lies, the new Americans are not interested in that. And so the vast majority of the American public rejects the model of insurrection and propaganda and coups. Um, but what we have here is a race between the will of the majority and popular government versus a bag of tricks. And the tricks uh, are basically manipulations of the political system. So it's the gerrymandering of our congressional districts, which is not in the constitution or in federal law. Uh, the use of the filibuster to thwart voting rights legislation. Again, the filibuster, not in the constitution, not in federal law. The passage uh, in certain states of voter suppression statutes, again, totally at odds with what our constitutional history and values are. So that's the struggle that we're in. But I don't want people to lose hope because I think the vast majority of the people of every conceivable political stripe and party believe in our constitutional democracy and don't want a republic based on lies and propaganda. Is there a way though, Congressman, to more effectively reach out to the segment of the population that seems susceptible to this manipulation that is disenfranchised uh, and, and feeling left out or is that a waste of time? No, I don't think it's a waste of time. I think it's really the central task. I mean, that's what I want the young people coming to work with me in the summer to be doing, to be reaching out neighbors to neighbors, friends to friends all over uh, the country. Uh, I think that Donald Trump succeeded spectacularly in his 2016 campaign, precisely because he appealed to a lot of real feeling in the public that there was corruption in the political process that uh, the, the parties had turned away from the interests and the plight of working people across America. So we've got to make sure that we're being responsive. I feel great about what we've done on infrastructure in the country, a trillion dollar infrastructure plan that we passed. I feel great about the Build Back Better plan, which is about a massive investment in the social infrastructure to reduce prescription drug prices, to bring those down for people, to invest in universal pre-K for three-year-olds and four-year-olds, to empower and liberate our young working parents. Um, this is what government's got to do. Government's got to be an instrument of the common good. So we got to restore and renew everybody's faith in the ability of government to meet the needs of the people, but we're not gonna get that way through propaganda and stereotyping and racism and all of the darkness of the 20th century, which is what they're trying to bring back. We gotta move forward into this century, bringing everybody together um, and confronting the problems of our time. I mean, how, if we're spending all of our time fighting the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and political corruption, how are we gonna deal with climate change, which is, uh, a nightmare bearing down on all of us, you know, with record forest fires out in the West and record drought throughout the Midwest and record flooding in the East and hurricanes of record velocity hitting the Southern coast. Um, we've got to confront the reality of climate change and we don't have time to be relitigating uh, the fascist agenda from the 20th century. So do you think that the best way to change hearts and minds is to change lives and that you do that by legislation, 
the kind that you just mentioned? Um, and, and do you think that's the most effective way to, to reach out to some of these constituents? It's going to be a combination of legislation, as you say, and education. And the legislation is something the government has got to do to meet people's needs where they are. But education is something that uh, political leaders and political parties have got to do. We've got to educate people about what facts really are so that people are not being fed this constant diet of propaganda and fake news. Good luck on that. But that's another, that's a whole nother podcast, Congressman. Um, Congressman Jamie Raskin, your book is Unthinkable Trauma Truth and the Trials of American Democracy. I think we talked about all of that today. So thank you so much, Congressman, for your time. The pleasure has been all mine, Katie. Thank you so much for reading my book and taking it seriously. I really appreciate that.